Hi guys, in this video we'll be looking at active transport, the process of active transport, and then we'll finish with a summary. So, so far we've covered how substances can passively move across the membrane into or out of the cells via different types of diffusion. So for example, we've talked about how molecules like CO2, which are small and uncharged, move into the cell via passive diffusion. We've talked about how certain charged particles like ions can move into the cell or out of the cell via facilitated diffusion. And we've also talked about how water can move through cell membranes via osmosis. So these are three transport pathways we've come across. And these processes basically are allowing the substances to enter or leave a cell down a concentration gradient. And because they're going down the concentration gradient, the cell doesn't need to expend any energy. So every time we've talked about these pathways, they've gone from an area where there's a high concentration of them to an area where there's a low concentration of them. And the net movement is from high to low, with obviously some random movements behind, but actually the net movement is from high to low. And this is all passive, so there's no need to spend any energy or use ATP. However, there are occasions where cells need to transport substances into or out of the cell against their concentration gradient. So this is a bit more different, but sometimes it's required, for example, to set up a concentration gradient for neurons. So what happens is this time we have our high concentration and low concentration area again, but this time we're moving particles up their concentration gradient. So it's kind of pushing them uphill. This has no way of occurring passively because the natural motion of the particles doesn't really favor this. Remember all particles in the air or liquids move randomly and they collide randomly with each other. And so it would never work in this way because eventually they only want to take part in normal diffusion down a concentration gradient. So instead of this, cells use specific carrier proteins to pump a substance across the membrane against its concentration gradient. So it's a very selective energetic process. So if this was the cell membrane, there are particular proteins found in the membrane, which are carriers or pumps, and they basically take molecules, change their shape and send it to the other side against its concentration gradient. Because this process cannot happen naturally, it requires energy in the form of ATP, and so we call it active transport. Active is the opposite of passive. So active transport is the movement of particles from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration across a cell membrane using ATP and protein carriers. So in order for the process of active transport to work, the particle needs to bind to a specific site in the carrier protein. So here we have our cell membrane again, and the overall objective is to move this red particle from its area of low concentration to an area of higher concentration. And remember, proteins are normally built with a specific 3D shape, and it will only fit to the correct specific particle and move it to the correct specific direction. So the carrier protein needs to have a specific site for that particle to bind to. And then different carrier proteins for different particles will have slightly different 3D shapes and different binding sites. On the inside of the cell, facing the cytoplasm, ATP binds to the carrier protein at a slightly separate site. So if this was the inside, ATP binds to the carrier protein too. The ATP gets hydrolyzed to ADP and phosphate group, and this releases energy. And the energy is then used to move the carrier protein into a different conformation or a different shape. So essentially the original ATP has been hydrolyzed to release energy and the products of that reaction are ADP and phosphate group or PI and that energy was used to change the protein's shape so that this end is now closed and this end can now be exposed to the particle. So it's all about using energy from ATP in order to do this. At this point the carrier protein is now open to the other side of the membrane and closed to the previous side and then the particle simply gets released. So the protein has changed shape to allow this part to open, and then the particle simply goes through and joins the others. And now we've achieved moving this particle from one side to the other without making the particle squeeze through the membrane, which is massively unfavorable, and we've used a carrier protein to change shape and allow this to happen. Once the particle's gone through, that phosphate molecule from the ATP hydrolysis is released from the carrier protein, and the carrier protein now has the correct chemical structure to return to its original shape. So now the phosphate group leaves and all of the chemical bonds are no longer under stress. So the protein can now go back to its original shape, opening this side and closing off that side. 
and it's most likely at this point that another ATP molecule will come and bind to the carrier protein once another particle comes along and the cycle can begin again. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you are looking for an amazing A-level biology resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the snap revised smiley face and together let's make A-level biology a walk in the park.